This video, Limits of Hinge Performance, is part of a series intended to provide insights into the tree felling methods, details, and risks. This particular installment provides a detailed explanation of the performance of the hinge as the tree begins to fall. As such, it is primarily for those who are interested and doesn't provide much on technique. One tree felling myth is that if you cut a good open face notch, the hinge will be able to control the direction of fall all the way to the ground. In reality, the hinge is largely compromised and ineffective at controlling side lean once the tree has fallen through about 30 to 45 degrees. Before we look at how a hinge operates, we need to look at the mechanical properties of wood. By comparison, steel is an isotropic material, meaning that its properties are identical in all directions. Wood, on the other hand, is a highly anisotropic material, meaning that its properties vary greatly depending on the direction under consideration. The most obvious confirmation of this phenomena is that we split wood along the axis of the log rather than across the grain. Rats! Anyone who has tried to start a dull drill in pine knows that the bit will try to slide off the hard part and attack the softwood in between. The soft part of each year's growth is called the early wood and forms when the tree is growing vigorously and doesn't have the time to make the wood dense. The hard part is formed as the growth is slowing down and the tree can make its wood denser. The early growth and the late growth have very different strengths. Consequently, the softer wood can either crush or shear quite easily by comparison. This illustration shows an example of a block in simple shear. Let's replace that uniform block with a block of wood with its grain perpendicular to the shear force. In this orientation, the wood can present its strongest resistance to shear. If we rotate that block through 90 degrees, it is obvious that it will be much easier to fail, as the entire shear plane can run through the weak early growth. Another property we need to consider is elongation at failure. Structural steel is an elastoplastic material. This means that it will behave elastically up to its yield strength but will then deform plastically until it finally breaks. In the elastic range, a sample will stretch farther and farther as it is pulled, or in this case, bent harder and harder. However, once it reaches its elastic limit, it will essentially begin to stretch without being able to support much additional load or return to its original shape. Wood, on the other hand, is essentially brittle in tension. It will stretch a little bit as it is pulled, but when it reaches its strength limit, it simply snaps apart. The amount of stretching is best expressed as strain, which is a dimensionless measure of the amount of movement divided by the length of the stretched piece. The amount of tensile strain that wood can tolerate before it snaps varies with the species. The ultimate tensile strain is a surprisingly hard value to obtain. One of the few sources of information on this subject is in the publications of the USDA's Forest Products Laboratory. For most species, the strain at failure is near or less than 1%. An 8-foot 2x4 is 96 inches long. Assuming it fails in tension at just under 1% strain, that means the 2x4 would snap apart after being stretched by just one inch. Now let's consider compression failure at the cellular level. There is a great deal of variability in the cells found in wood. Most are about a hundred times as long as they are wide. 
As a good generalization, however, most can be modeled as a elongated structure with a thick shell of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and a weak inner body that is often hollow after the protoplasm is lost. So let's put together a grossly simplified and shortened model of several cells of wood in our trunk. Under a heavy compression load, the walls can buckle and tear apart. The load that it takes to bend and break the walls is typically less than the tensile load it takes to pull the walls apart. Once failure occurs at the micro level, behavior at the macro level differs. When the cells are crushed, their parts don't go away. They remain as a crushed mass that, if adequately confined, can resist a very high compression load. This is referred to as the bulk modulus and is quite high when compared to the initial cell crushing. In tension, once the walls tear, there is nothing left to resist the tension. The ripping will be between some of the cells and through some of them. Once the wood is torn, that part of the wood can offer no further resistance to the tension. Now let's take a close look at the mechanics of how the hinge bends and breaks. In this illustration of a trunk and a hinge, the curved arrow at the top represents an overturning moment induced either by wedging, pulling with the rope, or by an initial lean. The hinge, depicted in green, exerts a resisting or righting moment with tension on the left and compression on the right. The hinge will fail progressively in tension. This picture shows a close-up of the hinge left on a small elm tree. The diameter of this sapling at ankle level was only about 5 inches, so the longest fibers are sticking up only about an inch, and the deepest pits are of similar depth. In other species, and with different growth conditions and trunk diameters, these spikes could be as much as a foot long, occasionally more. For typical conditions, however, most of the combined pit and spike lengths will total less than 8 to 12 inches. This is significant because it means that the portion of the trunk that has acted as a hinge may actually be up to 8 to 12 inches long, regardless of the step height that was used to cut the hinge. Also, the spikes and pits that are left will tend to underrepresent the amount of wood that was stretching before fibers failed. Let's redraw our hinge cross-section to reflect that it is causing strain failures both above and below the back cut and the apex of the notch. We'll use the same dimension as in the last video where we had a model with a cross-sectional area of 100 square inches. That circular area would have a diameter of 11.28 inches. Using a hinge that is 10% of the diameter yields a hinge of 1.128 inches. Since only a few of the fibers will break at the limit of the effective tensile area, the extreme ends of the hinge are shown as fading to brown. As the tree begins to lean, the leftmost portion of the effective hinge stretches and keeps stretching until the ultimate strain is reached at around 1% of its length, or 0.08 inches of movement. Let's focus in on just the hinge at the failure point in the moment before the tearing starts. We can calculate the angle at which this occurs in our model. The tangent of this angle will be 0.08 inches of strain divided by the hinge's 1.128 inch thickness. Taking the arc tangent yields an angle of just 4 degrees. This is somewhat in line with the angle of lean at which many trees will begin making their first cracking sounds. As the lean continues, the tearing will continue. Since the torn fibers no longer participate in resisting the lean, we aren't showing them in our illustration. 
In this illustration, the tearing is represented as having ripped through half the thickness of the hinge. So let's take a look at what angle of lean our model takes to tear halfway through. As before, the fibers are just about to break and have stretched 0.08 inches. The tree's angle of lean will be equal to the arctangent of 0.08 divided by half the original thickness of the hinge. The angle of lean when the hinge is torn halfway through works out to be 8 degrees. So far, our model has ignored the effects of compression on the right side of the hinge. Since both the dead weight of the tree and the effect of the bending moment will be concentrated there, we need to take those effects into account. Some of the cells in that area will be crushed and some compression will occur, so we will add that into our model. Although conditions vary, for medium to large trees there is often a zone about one-sixth of the thickness of the hinge where cells experience significant crushing. On the final stump, this can be seen as a zone where the spikes and whiskers are quite short. This occurs because the crushed fibers tear easily. We now consider the case where the tree has tilted to 45 degrees. The untorn fibers can still be considered as stretching to a maximum of 0.08 inches. To achieve a lean of 45 degrees, the portion of the hinge in tension will have a thickness of only 0.08 inches. At this point, the fibers to the left would be already torn, and many of the fibers to the right will be crushed. While the hinge still technically exists, at 45 degrees it is less than an eighth of an inch thick. At this tiny thickness, the hinge is no longer capable of resisting any significant side lean. Two minor points are worth covering. These are a reminder about the notch angle and the height of the step, and a caution about the outer fibers of sapwood at either end of the hinge. In this illustration, a 45 degree notch has closed. With its large falling momentum, the tree is almost assured of snapping what little remains of the hinge, provided the tree has not encountered anything that would significantly slow its fall. Since the hinge has already done its job of controlling the direction of fall, this hinge failure, caused by using only a 45 degree notch, is of no consequence to the direction. However, as mentioned in the video on the hinge, the closing of the notch means that the broken hinge will be pivoted up above the step as the tree continues to fall. In some circumstances, this could produce a dangerous kickback. The other point is that the sapwood fibers are not laterally constrained. As they are pulled in tension by the bending of the hinge, large bundles of them can slip outside of the trunk and escape the high tension by seeking the shortest route between two points. With most medium to large trees, any effect of these unbroken bundles of fibers will be easily overcome by the huge kinetic energy of the falling tree. For smaller trees and branches, particularly of species that tend to be tough and fibrous, these bundles can cause some annoying results, even affecting the direction of fall. To prevent these problems, an accepted practice is to make two shallow cuts through the sapwood on either end of the hinge. With these exterior fibers severed, the fibers at the new ends of the hinge are held in position to be snapped by the bending. With experience, woodsmen and arborists learn when such sapwood cuts are likely to be warranted. The next video in this series is or will be titled Leaners. If you have limited experience cutting down trees, I urge you to watch it for safety's sake.